Asile, The Engineer and the Island. Week 11, Day 1. It's a new week, and my arms are still very sore, so I'm not doing any new construction projects this week. I think I need a slightly longer break to recover because, honestly, I've been working like a madman up to this point. Part of this has been because I have to, of course, but a large part of it is also because I can. In spite of the challenges of living on this island, I have more freedom here to make things than I did back home, because I don't need to get permission from anyone to do anything, or worry about getting in someone's way. Just something I was thinking about. In any case, I did my morning chores, part of which now includes cooking and stockpiling lime for future projects. And when I got back, I did some planning for what I want to do with this week, as I'm enjoying the rhythm and challenge of doing one major project per week. This week, though, I want to mostly focus on harnessing the power of cold, and I have a few ideas for how to do that. First, as mentioned, the night sky is almost absolute zero, so I had the idea that I could turn the roofs of my buildings into stellar radiators at night using the same sort of control scheme I made for the solar array, to make reflective panels that open at night and radiate heat out, and close up during the day to keep heat from getting in, with the stone of the buildings storing that cold over the course of the day. That may be a bit big for the moment, however, so my other idea is to make an honest-to-goodness refrigeration system. There are also a few adjustments I still need to make to the kiln, and other items on my to-do list, so I'll start on those first. I dug up some clay and used the potting wheel to fashion a large, heavy cooking pot and lid for the kiln. I made the lid extra thick because I have plans to try using it as a pressure cooker in the future. For that reason, and for being so large, I reinforced it with bamboo cord before covering it with charcoal-infused clay to help it absorb radiant heat. At the same time, though, I wanted to be able to use it as a distiller. So I put a hollowed out piece of bamboo down the middle, and covered it with clay to make a sort of straw for vapors to come out through, and in anticipation of having to add water for distillation later, I made a second straw to pump fluids in through. I'll have to drill a hole in the bottom of the dumbwaiter, and build a distillation apparatus for it later. I'll have to leave this one in the sun to dry for several days. The next thing I considered to be of major importance, and require a lot of waiting, was that I needed to finally make myself a foam rubber pillow. This is honestly something I should have done when I was making my mattress, but I didn't have enough rubber at the time, and I got so busy with the solar array that I never thought about it until bedtime at which point it was too late and I had to just fluff up my crunchy, grass-filled pillow and deal with it. No more! Now that I've stockpiled some latex, I took a short hike up to the acid lake to collect some sulfur before returning and adding it to my latex with some vinegar to make it set. Fluffing it up and pouring it into the shallow pit, I dug some of the pressure cooker clay from planning all this ahead, you see. It's already lunchtime, so I'd like to take a break and plan my next move. Like I said, I don't think I'll be able to pull off a stellar radiator for my buildings for the moment, so I think an ammonia refrigerator is going to be my best option. I'm aware of a certain design that can, ironically, be powered by solar heating, but I've always had difficulty understanding how it works. A regular refrigeration system works on the principle of the ideal gas law, if you take a gas and compress it, all the molecules in it start bumping into each other more often as the gas gets denser, conserving their momentum and causing it to become hotter, and if you expand a gas, it becomes colder. The idea of a refrigerator or heat pump is that you expand the gas where you want things to be cold, and then compress it again where you want it to be hot, kind of like sopping up water with a sponge and squeezing it out in the sink. The sponge is the gas, and the water is the heat in this analogy. That would require me to build some kind of pump, and I don't know what kinds of pressures it would need to operate at, nor if any of the materials I have at hand handle it. 
there's another way to pull off functionally the same process, and that's with something called an adsorption refrigerator. Like I said, I don't entirely understand how it works, but I know that instead of using a pump, you use a salt that absorbs the heat-soaked vapors, which you then heat up again to dry the vapors off to repeat the cycle. I don't understand how this avoids adding heat to the gas, but it apparently works. I honestly wasn't sure which refrigeration system would work, so I decided to hedge my bets and try making both, since I am sort of trying to take this week off. If nothing else, it'll give me a chance to experiment with mechanical pump designs, which I can potentially use for other projects down the road. Always useful. I decided to build the pump first, since I've basically got salt piling up from distilling water. There are several different kinds of mechanical pump designs I'm familiar with, but the two I can make most easily in these conditions are a piston pump or a diaphragm pump. The piston pump is the most familiar, just two nested cylinders moving up and down with a couple of one-way valves to make sure the water flows the way you want it to, like an old-timey hand pump. It has the advantage of a high displacement volume, that is, how much water it can pump per stroke, and I could probably make a nice gasket for it out of rubber. However, these kinds of pumps wear out from friction, and the engineer in me kind of writhes inside at the thought of having to regularly replace the gasket, especially if I use it for something like pumping drinking water in the future, which would end up with particles of rubber in it. Friction is always the enemy. The diaphragm pump, on the other hand, has a large, flexible membrane, like a drum, that gets flexed back and forth, usually by compressed air, but they can be actuated mechanically, too. I suppose technically a turkey baster is a kind of diaphragm pump. Once again, one-way valves make sure that the water flows the right way, and sometimes these pumps can be made to pump on both halves of the cycle. I like these pumps because they basically only have one moving part, and the only wear is going to be from fatigue over a long period of time as the diaphragm flexes back and forth, and for an elastomer like rubber, that can take a while. The only big problem with it is low displacement volume compared to a piston pump, so you generally have to make it pump fast to compensate. They also generate much lower pressures for the same amount of force as a piston pump, because they have to spread that force out over a larger surface area. P equals F over A, or pressure equals force divided by area. The only way a diaphragm pump could compensate for this would be to take advantage of the one-way valves to build up pressure over several cycles, but it would still take a while. Again, I wasn't sure which was going to work best for my applications, so I figured on building one of each and trying them out. Either way, I was going to need some rubber, so I mixed up a batch and left it to set in the sun. The diaphragm was easy, just pour on a flat surface. And I reused my reflector mold for this, so future versions will be based on a standard size. The gasket for the piston pump was also easy, as I just used the butt of a piece of bamboo to make an indentation in some clay, which I poured a tiny amount of rubber into to create a simple O-ring. Then, to make the piston pump itself, I just split and hollowed out one piece of bamboo, while lathing another to fit inside as the plunger. It was already largely the shape I needed it to be, partitions and all. I used a bit of rubber to reseal the seams and wrap the thing in bamboo cord to give it strength against the pressure. Finally, I used some narrow lengths of bamboo to make several multi-purpose one-way valves. These were extremely easy to make in that it involved simply drilling a hole in the partition of the bamboo and putting a small rubber ball on one side of it, too big to fit through the hole, but too small to block water flow around it. Water can push the ball one way out of the hole, but not the other. A little cord or mesh across the opposite side of the valve to keep the ball from getting back out completed the valve. I still have a few hours, so next, I should think about where I'm installing this cooling system, and how I'm going to make the pipes. The most obvious place to put it is in the cellar, so the food can be kept actively cold, and thus even less likely to spoil. Like a big walk-in freezer, or rather a climb-in freezer. As for the pipes, once again the presence of bamboo makes my life really easy, as I can easily turn them into pipes. 
I cut down a bundle of bamboo and split and hollowed them out. I then wrapped them in cord to help them withstand pressure better, before dribbling rubber down the insides to create a leak-proof coating. I'd estimate this took me about 15 minutes each to make a section of this tubing, and each piece of bamboo is 50 feet tall at the most, so I could make about 200 feet of tube per hour. I can connect the pipes end-to-end -end later, reinforce them with cord, and soak them in latex to make the connection extra strong. If the cellar is approximately a cylinder 6 feet tall with a diameter of 10 feet, then it's going to have a surface area of 188 square feet. Call it 200 square feet to account for the dome ceiling too. If each tube is about 2 inches thick on average, then each tube can cover a wall area of about 8.3 square feet, meaning I'll need 24 tubes to cover it, which will take me a total of 6 hours to make. This isn't that bad, actually, because I can probably manage to make half of them before the sun goes down, and I should have plenty of time tomorrow to build the rest. With little better to do after dark, and needing a break from the tubes, I spent a couple of hours in the evening working on mosaics some more before getting ready for bed, remembering to grab my new foam pillow this time, which will need a little breaking in. While I was at the mosaics, though, I could see that I was going to run out of tile soon, so I should make a new batch, especially for the cellar, which will surely collect condensation in this humid climate. One more source of water, and hopefully better yet, ice. Week 11, Day 2 When I got up in the morning, I did my chores, and recognized I had a few additional ones I needed to do today. A few things I need to catch up on. I was running out of vinegar and toothpaste, so I set some rotten fruit aside in one of the distillers to ferment over the course of the day, and chopped up some vanilla grass and mixed it with ash for toothpaste. I also needed tiles for the cellar, as mentioned, so I spent an hour preparing some plates to dry for that as well. Although I recognized that it was not going to be particularly attractive, I made the tiles black with charcoal since this should help the refrigeration system absorb heat more effectively. This makes me wonder why they don't make the insides of refrigerators black at home. I still intended to glaze them, though, because they'll collect water condensation, and I need them to keep it out of the walls, which may cause the clay to expand and crack, especially if it freezes, though that may be premature. I also learned my lesson from the small tiles and changed the pattern on these ones to divide the hexagonal plates into large triangles, or arrowhead shapes, which I'll be able to place more quickly, since an intricate pattern will not be necessary. Also, I intended to use their shape to help direct water condensation along the seams quickly to the ground, where I may make a trough to collect it. I left them out to dry and got on with the refrigeration system. The vapor compression system will require, at some point, a place that forces the gases to expand, and another that forces the gases to compress. I think this is normally achieved with something called a throttle valve, but it's another one of those mysterious aspects of refrigeration that I don't understand all that well. I do know that I need to effectively change the volume of the pipes, but since bamboo comes in effectively a standard size, I think I can get the same effect from the gas's perspective, by splitting the path between many tubes. By increasing the volume of the container, the gases are forced to expand and cool. I think I understand now that the throttle valve is there to maintain pressure up to that point. It's just a narrow nozzle opening up into a larger volume, if I recall. I'm going to need this regardless of which pump I choose, mechanical or hot salt. And in some ways, it also kind of simplifies how I'll install the cooling tubes. I can have two main junction lines leading in and out of the cellar, and put holes along them to connect the cooling tubes to. I also realize now that because these tubes will be under vacuum rather than pressure, my rubber needs to be on the outside of the pipes, not the inside. Otherwise, a leak may cause the rubber inside to delaminate, collapse, and seal up the system which would be a good thing, I suppose. In any case, I hollowed out a few pieces of bamboo for the junction tubes and put holes in them with my drill press, 
before covering the outsides of the tubes I had already made with latex. In the process, I got an idea for how to manufacture strong rubber hoses, which I'm going to need eventually anyway. I could wrap a bamboo cord around a smooth bamboo shaft and coat it in latex. Once dry, I can remove the shaft and have a strong, flexible, waterproof hose, cord providing strength. It may be weak around the joints though, so a mesh might be better. I don't want to waste my cloth on that process though, so I have an idea to spool some bamboo cord onto the loom to create a very coarse but incredibly tough mesh. I loaded the loom with cord and set it running while I had lunch. When I came back, the mesh was more or less finished. I wrapped it around a bamboo form and used the sewing machine function of the lathe to hem the mesh into rough tubes, though the machine jammed a fair bit trying to thread the stiff bamboo cord, so I had to move slowly. Might have been just as good to sew it by hand. I'll rely on the latex to seal the mesh together at the ends. Finally, I dipped my mesh hoses in latex, relying on capillary action to drive the latex into all the crevices and spread evenly before hanging them out to dry. I'll join them together and apply additional coats of latex later. I then spent the remainder of the day finishing the construction of the cooling tubes, correctly this time. And after it got dark, I spent the evening working on my mosaics until it was time to have dinner and go to bed. Before I did, though, I started a fire and set the cellar tiles cooking the old-fashioned way. Week 11, Day 3 Today I tested whether the solar kiln was actually capable of cooking pottery, so before my morning chores, I loaded the pressure cooker into the kiln to cook for the day. When I got back from morning chores, I made a second batch of black tiles to dry, and gave the hoses a second coat of latex before working on the refrigeration system some more. I needed to start working on the pumping mechanism next. By this time, the membranes for the diaphragm pump were long finished so I put some latex around the edges and sewed them together to make a sort of balloon, installing one-way valves on either side. As I was going, however, I realized this wasn't going to work if there wasn't an existing cavity between the membranes, so I bent a small piece of bamboo into a ring to sit between the membranes, keeping them separated and giving the valve something to be attached to. I was quite pleased with the final construction. The piston pump was practically finished too, so now I finally need to think about the salt adsorption mechanism. I understand the principle. Certain materials are hygroscopic, meaning they absorb moisture out of the air. This should reduce the air pressure in a closed refrigeration system until an equilibrium is reached. Then you heat the material until the vapor is driven off, increasing the pressure on the other side of the system where it can be cooled, expanded, and run through the system again. The problem is that I don't know how to make sure the adsorbed vapor doesn't travel backwards through the system. It's like I need some kind of one-way valve built into the salt somehow. As a salt absorbs vapor, the law of diffusion says that the vapor should make its way through the salt until everything is evenly distributed. If you wet one side of a trail of salt, the salt on one side of the trail will be drier than the salt on the other side of the trail, and will absorb water from neighboring salt grains until everything is even. So if I make a long tube of salt heated only on one end, most of the vapor should evaporate off that end rather than being pushed back into the salt. So that end would always be dry, and always be sucking in vapor, almost like a capillary pump. Problem solved! I got a length of bamboo, hollowed it out, and prepared to pack it tight with salt when I realized a few other problems. In order to make the adsorption process occur as quickly as possible, I want the salt to have as much surface area exposed to the cold vapor as possible. But the same is true of the hot vapor side of the salt which also needs to be able to withstand high pressures. I took a moment to think about this. I suspected I could give the hot side a larger surface area by putting holes down the salt tube, easy enough to do with a few pieces of cord suspended in it, or by only coating the inside of the tube with salt. 
creating a large surface on the salt that's cold, but also creating a short path to the hot side was much harder. It was like I needed some kind of gas permeable thermal insulator. Like a foam? Again, that wouldn't help protect the system from back pressure, which is why I wanted to drive it through a tube in the first place. This is suddenly starting to feel like a much more complicated project than I originally thought. I'm taking a step back to think about what I can actually make, in contrast to what is conceptually optimal. To prevent backflow, I can make a salt-stuffed plug out of bamboo that can resist the back pressure, and will probably be short enough to let vapor diffuse through relatively quickly. Perfect. Just build a whole bunch of them and you've got yourself a large surface area. What's more, they can also be piped together easily to the cold side of the system. Pulling that off for the hot side of the system will be tricky though, since the return tubes would get in the way of any sunlight heating them, assuming I'm using solar heating instead of fire, which is what I want. I'll have to keep the hot sides of the plugs side to side in order to keep the face of the plug hot and facing the sun. Finally, should I use concentrated solar to increase the heating effect? Because it has such a comparatively large surface area to begin with, there isn't really a single point to focus the light to. I could make each tube end have its own array, like a bunch of little flowers, but that sounds like a lot of work to build, and it would at best sextuple the heat being absorbed by a given tube, along with the surface area of the pump which I might as well add more plugs to instead. Though I do like the idea of a bunch of tiny solar flowers from an artistic standpoint. What's best for that really depends on variables I have no way of knowing. Is surface area or temperature the dominant factor in the rate of evaporation? Without that knowledge, and with all the other factors seemingly determined, I decided to make the design open to both possibilities later. I worked on cutting a whole bunch of short bamboo segments, drilling a small hole in the partitions for vapor diffusion and pressure resistance, and holes in the sides for hot vapor to escape through. I then hollowed out some lengths of bamboo, and drilled holes in them through which to insert the plugs. I spaced the holes such that there was room to add more plugs or build mini reflectors around the first batch if I needed to. The cold side of the plugs only went part way into the cold side of the grid, while neatly passing over the tops of the hot sides of the plugs, so gases can flow freely around them. Finally, I took care to seal up all the joints with latex, outside on the cold vacuum side of the system, and inside on the hot pressurized side. The result was a sort of box-like framework that the right side of my brain really, really wants to make look like a flower bed now. After all that building and brain work, I stopped for lunch, and when I was done, I decided it was time to pull everything together. I started at the bottom and worked my way up, twisting the refrigeration tubes into the cellar and assembling them on the junction lines, using my digging stick to carve grooves into the wall as I went, so they would fit snugly. I found that the junction lines couldn't really bend around the tight corners of the cellar ceiling, so I had to extend the shaft of my power drill and use it to drill a hole through the soft clay floor of the kitchen and into the cellar where the junctions could sit mostly straight, being careful not to collapse the roof of the cellar. The tubes come out under the countertops, so at least they won't be in the way. I finished the connections by wrapping them with cord and sealing them with latex. The cold side of the system I ran through the north side of the building, where I set up the salt pump and my two mechanical pumps for testing. I came up with a simple and clever valve system so I could control which pump was active at a given time, creating a T-fitting of bamboo, and fitting a smaller piece of bamboo in the top as a shaft for turning the valve. Holes were drilled into its base at a right angle to each other, so I could only ever use one of the pumps at a time. Ergo, no risk of leaking. From the pumps, I attached and assembled the lengths of hose, leading around to the perpetually shady south side of the building, where I realized I needed to build some kind of cistern to fill with water, and coil the hose in for cooling. In the meantime, I set about attaching the hose and throttle valve back to the cold end of the system, 
and made one last modification before I did. A simple peg with a hole in it installed in the throttle valve so I can manually adjust the size of the throttle aperture. Smaller hole means higher back pressure on the hot side, which makes it hotter and thus has more heat to lose faster, though too much pressure could cause leaks or breakage. With everything built, there was nothing left to do but wait for the latex to set, and with the last couple of hours of sunlight, I set about digging up some soil and building a large pot for that cooling cistern next to the kitchen, and I'll make it so that it catches rainwater runoff from the roof. I also checked on the pressure cooker to see if it had set properly. I was a bit worried about this one because the thickness of the earthenware vessel made it more sensitive to gas expansion inside, and therefore more likely to crack, but giving it two days to dry appears to have been the right call. As for whether or not it got hot enough, a little bit to my surprise, it did in fact successfully fire the pressure cooker, which I carefully set aside to cool for the evening. This got me wondering exactly how hot the kiln is getting, which would also give me an idea of the limits of which I can effectively cook in it. Clay needs to be fired at 1000 degrees Fahrenheit or more to be fully set, and how hot the solar kiln gets is ultimately dependent on how well it can hold in heat. It's not radiating much due to the white exterior coating and the panels reflecting most of the heat back at the sun. It's not convecting much because the panels protect it from wind, and the reflective grates help minimize heat leaking out. It's not conducting much because it sits on stilts. Let's have some fun and actually do the math on this one. It's a good thing my engineering notes are still mostly legible after having been dunked in the ocean. Never leave home without them. By decree of the laws of thermodynamics, the solar kiln must lose as much heat energy as it gains from the sun, which is about 10 kilowatts, and it loses that energy through thermal conduction, convection, and radiation. Thermal power loss by conduction is equal to the material's thermal conductivity times its surface area and the temperature difference between the inside and outside divided by the thickness of the kiln. I filled the kiln with pumice, so let's say it has a thermal conductivity of about 0.15, same as insulating bricks for real kilns. It has a radius of about 1 foot and a height of about 3 feet, so let's say that it has a surface area of about a cylinder that size, or about 2.33 square meters when you finish doing all the math, and the thickness of the kiln walls is about 4 inches, or 0.1 meters. The temperature in the tropics is a depressing 25 to 28 degrees Celsius, or about 300 Kelvin. Rearrange the equation to solve for temperature inside the kiln, plug and chug the numbers, and you get an interior temperature of about 3000 Kelvin, or about 2280 Celsius. That's almost twice the melting temperature of iron, which seems like a bit much, so I'll check a few additional factors. I was assuming most of the solar energy wasn't conducting through the support post to get to the ground. If we say the coconut wood posts have a thermal conductivity of about that of other woods, around 0.15, interestingly, similar to the insulating bricks, they're about 6 feet tall where they're connected to the kiln, and have a diameter of about 0.1 meters as well. So that only bumps the temperature down a measly 0.5 Kelvin. Now that I think of it, I did notice a little charring around the posts, but it probably would have been a lot worse if I hadn't insulated them with clay first. Some of the heat is also going to get out through the surface of the kiln via convection. For the moment, I'll ignore the complicating factors of heat rising and billowing, creating a continual airflow around the kiln. In addition to assuming the panels protect the kiln from the blowing of the wind, and assume the heat is mostly getting into the air like normal thermal conduction. Air has a thermal conductivity of about 0.03, especially at higher temperatures, and there's no thickness to factor in, so that just leaves the surface area and temperature differential, which we know. Plug them into the math machine and we get another temperature drop of about 55 Kelvin, which is again a drop in the bucket on paper, though it's probably a bit more in reality. Still, even increasing that temperature drop by a factor of 10 would still leave me with 2600 Kelvin to work with, or about 2300 Celsius, which is still pretty crazy hot. Finally, 
there's still going to be some heat dissipation from radiation, even though I painted it white. And although the inside of the kiln is effectively exposed only to the heat of the sun, the outside is not. The heat loss due to thermal radiation is equal to the emissivity slash absorptivity of the material times a constant times a surface area times the difference of the temperatures raised to the fourth power. I coated the kiln in slaked lime, and that has an emissivity of about 0.89, which, now that I think of it, is much worse than I thought it would be. I would have almost been better off leaving it unpainted. And the constant is 5.67 times 10 to the negative eighth. So if we plug all the numbers into the dirt floor I've been using as a whiteboard, we get an interior temperature of 550 Kelvin at most, or 276 Celsius. That must be a mistake, though, because by the same logic, none of my kilns should be able to get hot enough to fire clay. Or if they did, it would be too hot to even look at. And yet, I can obviously touch the outside of my wood fire kilns while they're cooking a pot. And while they are warm, they aren't going to bake me alive just for walking in the room. The reason for this is that it takes heat some time to travel from the inside of the kiln to the outside. And the more insulating the material, the longer it takes. I don't want to get into the details of the lumped capacitance model of transient heat transfer right now, but by that logic, the kiln should get plenty hot before it starts radiating. Maybe that's why my textbook problem is always set to ignore radiation. Of course, if we completely ignore radiation, the kiln would be hotter than an industrial smelter on a budget of 10 kilowatts, so we have to draw the line somewhere. I vaguely remember something about the National Renewable Energy Lab making a 10 kilowatt solar furnace, which got up to about 1800 Celsius. Granted, they were focusing that heat onto a 10 centimeter diameter circle, but they also weren't storing that heat in a kiln, as far as I can remember. It's probably not a great compromise as far as estimation is concerned, but it's the best I've got. Though, even if it only got close to that temperature, it would still be quite impressive. I still have some time before the sun goes down, but I can't really think of much to do. I can't really start tiling the cellar because I need to check the refrigeration system for running leaks first. I'm tired anyway, so I think I'll just start working on my mosaics and fire the next batch of black tiles until it's time to go to bed. Shouldn't be too hard. Week 11, Day 4. Today I finally gave that refrigeration system a test. First though, I did my morning chores and, as a test of the new pressure cooker, I filled it with salt water to see how well it would work as a distiller. Once I was done, I began filling the refrigeration system with coolant. I decided to use ethanol instead of ammonia, because I happen to have a lot more of it right now, and frankly, I didn't want to spend a whole day this week distilling urine. Nor did I particularly want it near my food, even though I knew it was sterile. Ethanol isn't good for you either, but it's not as toxic as ammonia, since people regularly drink the former and not the latter. I used the diaphragm pump to suck the ethanol out of my pots and into the refrigeration system, not filling it up completely because there needed to be room for some of the gas to evaporate. I started with testing the piston pump, but I quickly found that the rubber seal failed because I couldn't make my equipment to high enough tolerances, and the o-ring was easily degraded anyway. In that regard, the diaphragm pump worked much better, since it didn't have any moving or abrasive parts. However, I had to pump it pretty fast to get any appreciable pressure in the system, which quickly leaked out again as I hunted for leaks. This led me to another problem that I hadn't really given a lot of thought to, which is how I would be continuously powering these mechanical pumps. I didn't want to stand there pumping all day. This led me instead to start testing the solar heating pump, and while it took a while to get heated up in the morning sun, I soon found that it did work and it did build up pressure in the system, which made it easier for me to hunt down and seal leaks with latex. At this point, I also began to understand how the solar pump works, and that it wasn't working quite the way I thought it was. I realize now that the ethanol is not absorbed by the salt because it's not a polar molecule. However, the ethanol isn't 100% pure. There's a little water in it, 
and that's what the salt's absorbing and pumping around the system. By absorbing that water vapor, it drops the pressure in the cold side of the refrigerator, causing the ethanol to evaporate and take heat with it, which gets picked up and taken away, in turn, by some of the water vapor. Then on the hot side, the water vapor forms high-pressure steam, which gets compressed as it tries to squeeze through the throttle valve, and cools through contact with the water in the cistern outside, before rejoining the ethanol vapor to repeat the cycle. It was going to take a while before there was any noticeable cooling, so I kept looking for leaks in the meantime. While I was down sealing leaks in the cellar, it occurred to me that a slow leak of ethanol vapor down there might cause it to form a deadly and intoxicating gas. The only upside, though, is that because this side of the system will be under vacuum, it should tend to suck air in rather than let vapor out. Still, it's a risk to be minimized, and sealing in the refrigeration system with grout and tile should help with that. I could hear the vapor bubbling at the bottom of the cooling lines while I worked. I kept hunting for leaks and reinforcing joints neurotically until about lunch. When I came back, having become acclimatized again to the warmth of the island, I noticed the cellar did feel cooler, much cooler than it was before, which is very encouraging, not to mention refreshing. I decided at this point, having plugged up all the leaks I could find, to begin tiling the cellar. I was able to place one tile every five seconds or so, and with each of these new tiles being one-sixth of a square foot, and me having 180 square feet of tile, it only took me a couple of hours to finish. I still had several hours before the end of the day, so I wanted to try some experiments to see how, or if, I could make the adsorption pump more effective. I went to the workshop and split and hollowed out some more bamboo, which I also put holes in as a frame to go over the top of the solar pump plugs. I then grouted some small mosaic tiles around the holes to make little reflectors, in various colors too, to make it look like a patch of flowers, because I couldn't help it at this point. I also made another valve that could turn one side of the solar pump off. The idea was that I would put reflectors over just one half of the plugs, and if the refrigeration system cools down sooner tomorrow than it did today, that'll tell me the total heat input is a greater factor than the size of the adsorption surface. I also tracked down whatever scraps of rubber I had left to make a couple of bands for a solar tracking mechanism to turn the whole box to face the sun all day. I finished installing these add-ons around the time the sun went down. Then I spent the evening working on my mosaics in the kitchen some more, before getting ready for bed. Week 11, Day 5 I found today that, aside from testing the refrigerator, I didn't really have anything I needed to do. So after my morning chores, I figured I'd do some experimentation with the pressure cooker rig. It really didn't produce much water yesterday because I didn't have a cool place for the water to condense just got steam, which kind of gave me ideas for a steam engine, but I'll put that one on the back burner for a while. The truth is that I've never really used a pressure cooker before, so I'm not exactly sure what it's good for, besides canning, in which case it could be used as an autoclave to kill germs, I guess. But again, since I don't have anything better to do today, I'll mash up some of the fruits I've collected today to make a jam, and put a little latex around one of the lids of my small pots to make a seal. I put some latex around the edges of the pressure cooker too, as I designed the lid with a sort of lip to help hold in pressure, and the seal should help with that. I also made little rubber balls to seal up the inlet and outlet tubes. I set the cooker boiling in the morning and went off to make a rubber hose for cooling and distilling the steam later. Same process as before, wrapped bamboo in cord, coated with rubber, removed bamboo core, applied more coats as needed, and hung out to dry. It feels like an early Sabbath, which is probably a good thing given all the work I've done lately. Though at the same time, less to do makes me depressed. When I was done with that, I checked on the refrigeration system. Without a thermometer, it was hard to accurately say whether the refrigerator was working more or less effectively today than it was yesterday. Nor could I determine whether solar heat or diffusion surface was a greater factor. Maybe it was just me, but it might have felt a little cooler today, 
which kind of makes sense since a real refrigerator would cool faster the more energy was put into the pump. This suits me just fine, because I really like that silly little fake planter box. I reopened the valve I put on it the other day for full solar heating, and that should bring the temperature down even more. I'm at a loss for what to do now, since I figure I should give the pressure cooker a bit more time before I check on it. It's only been about an hour. I'm going to need more tile for the lab and kitchen eventually, so I guess I should just work on some of those until lunch. Most of the tiles I made were either white from lime or green from olivine powder, partly because those were the most commonly available, and partly because I found that a pleasant color scheme. I might have used more blue pigment, but I didn't want to use up what meager copper deposits I had for the sake of decoration. After lunch, I checked on the pressure cooker, and I was pleased to note that it hadn't exploded. I did notice something, though, when I tried to open it. The soft latex seal and balls had become much stronger and harder from the heat. That makes sense in hindsight, because the heat must have accelerated the vulcanization process, but I'd more or less given up on it at this point because of the difficulty of maintaining the right temperature with fire alone. However, the autoclave function of the pressure cooker reminds me that high pressures increase the boiling temperature of water. That's how it's able to kill bacteria. However, that also means I can cook things at a consistent temperature, because the pressure controls the boiling temperature of the water. I can use this to vulcanize my rubber in a more controlled fashion. I considered running some tests, but then realized that I effectively already had. The rubber seals had already vulcanized properly, so, excitedly, I started throwing my various uncured rubber items into the pressure cooker, like my rubber boots, rain jacket, backpack, and the rubber hose I made earlier. Couldn't do it with my pillow and mattress, though, because they were obviously too big. While they cooked, I made an extra sheet of rubber, which I plan to use to replace the unvulcanized rubber bands in my other projects, as these will last longer and be stronger. Even so, I still found myself with several hours to kill before evening. I decided to just have a moment to stop and think. It was kind of nice anyway to just sit and draw again like I used to. It's so hard to find the time when you're an adult. I never did come up with a way of using the cold of space to control the temperature of my buildings, but I think that would require having something to store the cold during the day and then recool it at night, like ice. A vapor would probably be easier, though, which could rise up into the cooling array during the day as it warms, and then condense at night, taking the cold back down with it. Probably ethanol, but maybe ether if I want something that really needs cold temperatures to condense. I think it's made from ethanol and sulfuric acid, but I'd need to experiment with it, and I really don't have the tools right now to properly contain and work with gases. Another for the back burn. As for the condensation tower, I imagined having a bunch of black hoses wrapped around the roof of the kitchen to radiate heat at night, and to protect it from absorbing radiant heat from the island during the day. I could use smaller reflector panels to more or less block their line of sight. It wouldn't really be too hard to add onto the existing refrigeration system. I just need more hoses and tiles. I decided to go for it since I have one more day to kill before the actual Sabbath, spending the rest of the afternoon building and vulcanizing more hoses until the sun went down. I had to make these hoses a bit differently though, since I suspected they would be subject to vacuum pressures. But at the same time, I couldn't just use rubber-lined bamboo because it needed to be flexible enough to wrap around the roof of the kitchen. So, as I went, I cut pieces of bamboo into rings, which I slipped over my hose core and linked together with rubber and cord, making something almost more like a chain than a hose. The lathe helped tremendously with making the rings quickly. I ended up making four black vulcanized rubber hoses before sunset, and spent the evening finishing off the fine mosaic tiles in the kitchen. I'll work on the large tiles later, and fire the tiles I prepared already overnight. 
it doesn't escape my attention that the solar kiln hasn't entirely alleviated my dependence on wood for fuel, but at the same time, this is just as much about using my time efficiently. Week 11, Day 6 In the morning, I loaded up the kiln with my latest batch of unfired tiles and conducted my morning chores. I decided that I should probably add tile making to my morning routine until all the buildings are tiled the way I want them to be, so I made another batch of tiles when I got back from foraging, before getting on with the stellar radiator I designed yesterday. I started by gathering the hoses I made yesterday and secured them to the roof of the kitchen, wrapping them around the dome at the top. I found I had to carefully drill pegs into the clay roof to provide a place to support the hoses, but after that, I easily secured them with cord. I didn't have enough hoses and stopped to calculate how many I would need to make. Each hose is about 50 feet long and about 2 inches wide, so I'll need 18 of them to cover the whole surface of the dome, more than I was expecting, and I was again caught off guard by jumping in and not doing a lot of planning. Plus, I've set aside the kiln for the day by firing tiles in it. It would basically take me all of today and tomorrow to finish making the hoses, and I haven't even figured out how I'm going to install the reflector panels yet. What a mess I've made for myself. I'm frustrated, but at the same time, Strangely, I kind of like it. Better than yesterday when I felt like I was running out of things to do. I figured that if I wanted to get this done in a timely manner, I needed a faster way of making hoses. Just cutting the bamboo into sections takes at least 15 minutes. So I took some time to make a jig with several stone cutting tips in it, so I could cut all the rings off a piece of bamboo in one go on the lathe. Then I thought it would be nice if I didn't have to pick up each ring and re-thread it onto the hose core, so I attached a cutting tip to the end of the hose core so I could drill out the center of the bamboo section first. Then, once the rings were cut, they would already be in place. Finally, I prepared a small bamboo trough that I could fill with latex and simply dip the rotating hose in. This will force me to make smaller sections of hose and fit them together as I go. But if it takes me about five minutes to make a two and a half foot section of hose, then it should take me a hundred minutes to make a fifty foot hose. Not much better than before, actually. But if I can stretch my apparatus past the edge of the lathe and across the room, a bit dangerous, to make a ten foot section at a time, then it should only take me about half an hour to make each hose, cutting my time in half. It's not a great compromise, and it'll take a fair amount of finagling but I think I can make it work. Between hoses, I transferred the tiles to the kitchen kiln to cook, and went back to using the solar kiln for vulcanizing hoses once they were dry. It's the end of the day now, and I'm exhausted, but I got them all finished. More than that, though, I feel really weak and shaky, because I was so absorbed in the work that I forgot to stop for a lunch break. I'm going to have an early dinner before I faint. I'm a bit irked that I basically lost a day on that project, and I'll have to extend it into the Sabbath in order to finish it. But that's what happens when you fail to plan. I don't intend to make the same mistake again, though I've said that before, so I'll spend my evening planning how I'm going to make the reflector array tomorrow before I go to bed. almost forgot to fire the tiles I made this morning beforehand. Week 11, Day 7 I got up this Sabbath morning knowing I had some work to do. Somewhat annoyed, but I have to balance that with the fact that, in other ways, I gave myself a week off because the work I've done with the refrigeration system has been light. With that in mind, I did my morning chores, loading the solar cooker with coral sand to see how well it could make lime, and started work on finishing off the stellar radiator. I began by installing all the hoses I built yesterday, and I had to use up the latex I collected this morning to seal everything up, because I'd used up my stockpile making hoses yesterday. I stopped to make a small valve and connected the system to the condenser hose I put on the side of the kitchen. 
This valve can basically open a pathway to the rooftop radiator or close it. For the moment, I kept it closed so the roof wouldn't heat up the gases currently in the refrigerator. Still a bit weak from yesterday, I had an early lunch and thought about how to install the reflector panels. I cut down some bamboo and bent it into rings that I affixed to the roof similarly to the hoses. I also cut several hollow lengths of bamboo and fit them together into a T. The crossbar I slid onto the rings, and the stem I cut a slotted joint into, which would grip the reflectors. Finally, I tied a little cord to each one, and once the system had been assembled, I threaded the cord down the oculus of the kitchen, so I could open and close the apparatus at will. I found that I also had to add a cord to pull them back down, so I made this part of a pulley system. I also added some pegs to the rings, so that the panels couldn't open too far. This took me several hours, and when it was finished, I was a little bemused by the fact that now the roof of the kitchen kind of looks like a giant pineapple because of the hexagonal panels. I didn't like having the string hanging through my beautifully mosaic ceiling, though, so I used two of the vulcanized rubber bands I made the other day to make a control system for the stellar radiator. One pulls the system closed by default, and the other is connected to the hot side of the refrigeration system so that, as it heats up with the sunlight, it slackens the cord, causing the panels to close. I'll just need to remember to open and close the valve every morning from now on. With my last hour of sunlight, I went around replacing the various rubber band-based mechanisms around the base with the vulcanized ones I made the other day, and set the old ones aside to be vulcanized properly tomorrow. When night fell, I didn't have any more tiles to assemble, so I just took a few hours to rest, write, and look at the stars, since I haven't had an entirely proper day off today. I set my latest batch of tiles in the kiln to cook overnight before getting ready for bed. Blooper rail! To make reflective panels that open, that, to create, and that's with something called an adsorption, an adsorption refrigerator, and that's with something called an adsorption, adsorption, adsorption refrigerator. I cut down a bumble, 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 bumble. All right, reading ahead is just wasting my time, apparently, so I'll just uh, read and make mistakes as I go, and again, leave it for the editor to sort out, because apparently that takes less time. Just FYI, future me to past me, more than half this recording was mistakes I had to spend all day cutting out, so maybe this doesn't work after all. I was running... Come back here. The vapor compression system will require, at some point, a place that forces the gases to expand at the other. A place, a place that forces the gases to expand, and at another that that forces the gases to compress. Hold on a sec. The vapor compression system will require, at some point, a place that forces the gases to expand, and another that forces the. Yeah, there shouldn't be an at there. Pause. Boolie boolie boo. So I bent a stick or a small piece of bamboo into a ring to sit between the membranes, keeping them separated and giving the valve something to be attached to. I was quite... I was quite... <sighs> then you heat... Then you heat the gas and... I should say salt. Hold on. If you wet one side of a trail of salt... The salt on the other side of the trail will be drier than the salt on the other side of... On the other, on the other, on the other. What am, what am I talking about? So gases can flow freely around them. So gases can flow... Fr so... Fr interestingly similar... Interestingly similar to the... Interestingly similar to the... Ins Instratingly... Smurling a schnurg... Interestingly similar to interestingly similar to the insulating bricks. Same process of same process as a says, 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 says. No plan, keep those bottles quiet. 
All right, make the microphone pay attention to me so I could. So, so I attached a so I attached a cutting tip to the end of the hose core so I could drill out the center of the. More than that, though, I feel really weak and shaky. I should probably go back and adjust my tone. Excuse me. And open a pathway to the roof rob. Just a heads up, uh, future me to past me. This. I'm gonna try that again. Even my bloopers have bloopers. Hey there, thanks for listening all the way to the end. I had fun this week figuring out how the adsorption refrigerator works on my own, and I think this proves that there's almost nothing I won't do to avoid the heat. I've got more hijinks planned on that front, so if you want to listen to the next episode as soon as it's ready, like a frozen soda on a hot summer day, you can hit the subscribe and bell buttons to get notified as soon as it's ready. Slushy, but not frozen. I find around 50 minutes in the freezer to be just about optimal. As I've mentioned before, I'm not doing YouTube for money, but it would still help me out more than anything else if you could share this video with someone you think would enjoy it. And since you apparently thought it was cool enough to watch this far, you can press the like button to say so. That thumbs up will also flag down an ice cream truck. You can also press the dislike button if you didn't like it, but be warned, it'll give you brain freeze. Also, if you'd like to chat about your own stories and perspectives on the episode, like tips and tricks you've tried for beating the heat, feel free to write them down in the comments section below. I'd love to hear them, and I'm always open to suggestions and corrections. That said, thanks again for listening, and hope to see you here again next week.